All right. Ooh, that's loud. I talk loud. Uh, before I get started, let's. Uh, the organizers and crew have done a fantastic job today. Could you join me in thanking them? And good job. Another point of pride for this great institution. All right. Um, this is going to be a mini crash course in something that every one of you is going to deal with in the next five years. Many of you are young, so it'll be one of your older loved ones or family members. And we're talking about the world of personalized medicine. And I think you've heard a little bit about this in the past. Um, certainly, if you watch television, you've probably all seen the uh, Clopidogrel is marketed as Plavix commercial, where the guy walks around and the empty uh, gurney follows him. Have you seen that? Remember that commercial? Yeah, I, know. I don't like to watch commercials either. But, um, <laughs> but that commercial was launched about a year ago. And a few months after it was launched, an extra line was added to the narrative that said, uh, genetic testing might be needed to see if clopidogrel or Plavix is right for you, which is kind of like throwing a grenade. And what, what, what do you mean by that? I don't know what you mean by that. You scared me. You know, of course, these commercials come out. My family calls and says, what, 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 what are we, what's going on there? You know, could you explain that? I'm going to try to teach you this in 10 minutes. I'll probably fail, but what I want you to do is get enough of this so you can at least talk to your doctor, because this thing area is exploding. And what we're talking about, the technical term is called pharmacogenomics, or merging the term from pharmacy or pharmacal sciences with genomics, okay? And the diagram I have behind me is the intersection of DNA, or DNA genomes, medications or drugs, and disease management, or more often now, dis disease prevention. There we go. Quickly, crash course. The genome is made of large contiguous strands of DNA, chromosomes. We all remember this. Some of us love those classes, some of us hated them. Um, but in that there's a lot of information in that. And a side note about um, DNA and genomic sciences and why it moves so quickly is unlike other biomolecules, if you know how to study DNA, you can do any organism on the planet. Bacteria, plants, we all use the same genomes, for, uh, the same biomolecules for the same purpose. Importantly, each cell of our body contains our entire genome, which means if you want to use genetic information about a brain disorder or something about the liver, you don't have to go to that tissue to get it. In fact, most uh, personalized medicine applications that are emerging, um, which is, this is last year and this year have been very big so far in this, use a cheek swab, basically a Q-tip uh, rubbed against your inner cheek, mail it off and do that. We're already using kind of DNA uh, in our society. Uh, for a number of different things. We're all familiar with paternity testing, which uses mitochondrial DNA. Um, forensics, which makes for a lot of good TV. Um, but uh, uh, we, we do use this for uh, both implicating and exonerating uh, criminals. Um, disease identification. Certainly can't use DNA to hold this under my face. Um, <laughs> so um, we, a lot of disease were really learned, uh, the field really emerged out of using the genomic and genetic information to identify disease states, and we learned a lot more about the genes that were associated with disease long before anything else. And what I'm talking about today is personalized medicine. Now, as we talk about innovation, I want to point out something here because uh, I'm a co-founder of a company that's involved in this space, and I've got some patent filings in this space, but when we think about these things, um, when we talk about innovation, we have, and you've heard this th uh, tone throughout today, is you have to consider everybody's perspective. So it's one thing for me to prescribe, uh, pardon the pun, pr prescribe to a physician, this is how you're going to do it. Well, you know, if you've ever tried to tell your physician what to do, they, they, don't, they don't like that at all, you know, particularly if you're trying to sell them something. So, uh, so when we talk about the use of genomic information here, I want to point out one thing as a consideration as we talk about translating uh, this science into a commercial endeavor. When we look at paternity testing, forensics, and disease identification, there's no reason for us to hurry that testing, right? You know, if it's forensics, the body's still going to be there next week. You don't have to run to the lab and do it real quickly. The value proposition for personalized medicine is get it done as quickly as possible. Somebody pre presents to an emergency room and, or uh, some other situation, and as we move from blockbuster drugs that work for all of us, you guys know that, to drugs that are more specialized, they may not always be safe or the particular dose may be determined using genetic information. Why is that? Crash course in pharmacology. Two concepts. You guys already know this. Just never thought about it. Uh, I'm sure you thought about it and never articulated it. How does a drug affect our body? That's why we take it, right? You take aspirin. Why do we take aspirin? It inhibits the cyclooxygenase enzyme 
reduces inflammatory response. For older guys like me, it keeps our platelets from sticking together and then we live a lot longer. Great. What does our body do to the drug? It's just as important. We eliminate that, right? How many people had a cup of coffee this morning or a Diet Coke? It's kind of nice out. So with uh, something with caffeine in it. Well, you absorb that caffeine. It distributes through the body. It does what it's supposed to do. By the way, the most popular psychoactive compound on the planet. And then your body oxidizes and eliminates it. And I've got an example of this here. Oh, we've got one more point here. This is very important. I've got to keep up with myself here. <laughs> Our genome contains information and there is differences between us. Two important concepts that are probably very interesting, but they're very real. You guys all know we're genetically different, right? But when we think about things about our diet and maybe d disease states and other things, we think, well, how can we be so different? We can all eat these foods. We all can't eat these foods, right? But we don't expect, there's not really much research in this, but there's poisonous mushrooms that are grow out in the woods, right? There may be genetic differences between us, but nobody's going to volunteer for that study. I I'll, I'll try it, you know, we're not going to do that. <laughs> But that brings up a point that our ancestors for the last 50, 100,000 years have been exposed to those um, foods and other items that contain these toxins. And some of them we can take and some of them we can't. We can take caffeine, right? We can take nicotine. These are things that are supposed to protect the uh, organisms from being consumed. That's different than pharmaceuticals, which our ancestors have never ex been exposed to, right? So there's never been any selective pressure to a synthesized compound and certainly at a dose that's much higher if it's based on a, in a, on a uh, natural product. So we've got variation there we have to consider. And it's much bigger than other things like I just cited, right? It's, it's very, very high. In fact, you probably know this already if you've got parents or grandparents, they're taking these drugs, uh, there's compliance issues that we deal with. Grandma and grandpa says, it does, I don't like how it makes me feel. They're not lying, they just don't know what to do, you know, and you know, anyway. That's an empowerment and compliance issue we're not talking about. <laughs> the other issue that's very interesting, uh, I just finished a textbook and I put some research into this. This is astounding to me. I didn't realize this. I'm the, uh, at my age, I'm the 10th generation on the planet and the students in this room are the 11th generation on the planet of humans that have lived with an average lifespan above 45 years old. We have a lot of genetic variation as we get older and get more dependent on our sciences, medical sciences pharmacy and so on. And so we've got a lot of new challenges that are coming up uh, both in the extending of extension of life and in some ways the re revelation or invention of disease and the use of genetic information to try to prevent those things as we learn more and more. All right, I'm giving you one quick example. There's my caffeine molecule. That's me. Uh, to stimulate the nervous system. We all know that. We enjoy it. We need it. Uh, we oxidize this in the liver and we eliminate uh, caffeine in the urine. Okay. There are genetic variations in this. I've had my genome screened. It's amazing to me what's happened, and I'm not supposed to endorse companies, but there's a big genome screening company out there that's kind of associated with Google. Cost me $200, and I got just under a, a million allelic variations called. Wonderful time for a science nerd like me. I found, among all these other things, that I'm a poor metabolizer of, of caffeine. What does that mean? My liver doesn't metabolize caffeine as quickly as most of you in this room. So I have a cup of coffee in the morning, which has two or three times the amount of caffeine as a Diet Coke, and I break out into a sweat, and I'm irritable more than usual, and so on. But these variations exist among all of us, right? Because there's no genetic uh, or ev recent ancestral evolution path that said we should all be similar in this space. It's quite different. All right, here's the, the, the fear tactic. Adverse drug reactions. Uh, about three-quarters of a million people each year in the U.S. die or sustain serious injury from adverse drug reactions. There are typically the fourth, fifth, or sixth leading cause of death a a every year in uh, our U.S. health system and is one of the leading preventable uh, uh, public health issues. Um, it costs the, the, these are different estimates here, but if you aggregate the estimates, about $3 billion a year. And there's been some uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield Medicaid changes that have really brought this to the forefront. I won't talk about but there's policy changes that are making us a little more associated with preventing uh, a disease rather than uh, managing it. And uh, genetic variation is estimated by about 30% of all these uh, ADRs are due to that. So I'm supposed to say something about innovation. Innovation. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to hold this for the end here. 
uh, this is how you implement it, and this is what uh, I, myself and some of the workers that I do with as consulting and with the company that I'm associated with, what we do. This is how you do it. Cheek swab cells, you know, to get the cells from your cheek, because remember, it has all the genomic content that we need, okay? Don't let your dog, if you kiss your dog on the mouth, don't do that 20 minutes before you do that. <laughs> you may get an odd diagnosis. <laughs> You'd think I'd be joking, but this stuff does come up. In fact, there's a lot of sources for that. Some of them are very comical. Uh, it turns out people get hair plugs. You can't use hair follicles for DNA because it's somebody else's hair plug. Anyway. <laughs> Think about that when you... Anyway, uh, then we screen for the DNA markers. We all know this. You don't need to know this uh, to, to be informed as a cons healthcare consumer that DNA can be tested and information can be garnered. In this case, we predict how we're going to react to a particular medication or dose and then we prescribe to make sure the drug is two things. It's efficable and it's safe, okay? That's it for me. Thank you all for coming. It's been a great day. I think we should get outside and enjoy the, not blizzard this year, tornadoes this year. So. Thank you.